Scott Loxley, I am a deacon here at 24 Church, and I am not the pastor or the lead preacher, if you will. For some of you who are new, you're probably like, oh great, I came here to hear the lead preacher and he's not here. Well, a couple of things. One, we look just exactly alike. (laughs) We're like identical twins. And number two, and I'm going to be a little prideful here, but the last time I was able to, had the honor of speaking, and honestly, first of all, it's an honor to be able to share God's word with anybody. Uh, And so it's an honor for me to be able to do this. I'm not uh, worthy of this at all, but it's it's something that the Lord gives you and you, you need to give it back out. But anyway, the last time I spoke here, a little prideful, uh, I had several people after we were through come to me with encouraging words and compliments, and it was really great. And what's interesting is they all said the same thing. Doc, that was a great job, just like I like it, short and sweet. <laughs> so if, you, if I can give you any encouragement at all, more than likely it'll be all those, th- well, that thing, especially the short and sweet thing. One, one time when I spoke up here, I surprised the band so much that we kind of had to stretch it out a little bit here and just wait for them to show up. So we'll see if we can try that, do that again today. Anyway, uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here, very glad to be here, and honored to be here. <clears throat> I want to start, uh, I want to start with prayer, please. Lord, thank you so much for, uh, for allowing us as brothers and sisters, to gather and study your word. God, I pray that uh, you will get me out of the way. You will, you will speak into each heart just like the Holy Spirit wishes, and that each heart will be open to hear what he has to say. Uh, we give this time to you, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're, we're in the book of Ruth, and in chapter 3. Chapter 3... In Ruth, there's some, not controversy, but there's some misunderstanding about it. So we're going to go through a few things first, right off the bat, that I'm going to talk to you about uh, historically, give you a little some facts. I love facts. I I love the, 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 I I like looking at the maps in the Bible. It's pretty cool to see like when Jonah was supposed to go this way, he went that way, you know, that kind of thing. But um, there's some facts and laws that we're going to go over. It's going to help lay a groundwork for the chapter three in Jonah. If you remember, I mean, in Ruth, I just got through with Jonah in Bible study. So. Uh, if you remember, and by the way, the Bible, the Bible each book kind of has, th- has a theme, if you will. I don't know what. Uh, the, for instance, Jonah, for instance, the, that, that would be maybe the God of second chances or um, God can outfish you because <laughs> he can make a bigger fish than you ever dreamed about. Uh, Genesis, the creation, or God choosing a people, Exodus, God delivering, that kind of thing. Ruth, it's, it's, it's God's providence. It's God showing that there's really no such thing as luck or chance. Do you believe in luck? Don't. A Christian shouldn't believe in luck. There's no such thing. Well, what about the lottery winner? Well, they happen to get the right number. But there's no such thing in luck. God has everything planned out, and it's important to know that. Uh, I like to fish, okay? I used to, be, used to fish a lot, but uh, a, little, a little bit prideful. Again, when people would ask me on the lake, hey, you having any luck? I'd say, no, I'm not, because I'm so good that I had a live well full of fish, <laughs> and it was skill, not luck. But my point is, there's no such thing as luck. If you had the right lure on, you threw it in the right place, you played the fish right, you caught the fish. 
God is that way. God is not a, a God of chance. He is a God of luck. I mean, he's a God of providence. He, he has everything planned for you, whether you realize it or not. And we'll learn about that in this book, Ruth. If you had a title for the third chapter, you're going to love this one. It would be Always Listen to Your Bitter Mother-in-Law. Now, you'll see what I'm talking about here in just a minute. So, If you remember the book of Ruth, uh, the famine hit. The family went to Moab where there was food. Uh, Naomi is the mom. Her father, I mean, her husband passed away. Her two sons passed away who had gotten married. She heads back to where the bread basket to where there's food again at home in Bethlehem. She, uh, she brings her daughters part of the way and then her daughter-in-laws and then she stops and they choose. They choose one way or the other. Ruth decides to choose the way of Naomi, the mother-in-law. Ruth decides to choose her way. Ruth has heard from Naomi about her God. And so Ruth says, hey, your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. I'm going with you. Now, the sister decided to go back to Moab. She had heard all about God from Naomi. Naomi was a good, uh, Naomi was sharing the word really well. They knew about God. But the other sister chose Moab rather than to go with Ruth. So you know the story. Now they're widows. They're in 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 an area back in Bethlehem. People know that that they're, but they're poor. And uh, they're, trying to eke out a living. So Naomi, the mother-in-law, tells Ruth about a law that's written in Hebrew law, and that was about gleaning fields. And Chris shared that with you, that a landowner had to leave some corners standing, and anything that fell on the ground, it was left there for people, poor people, to come and to glean the fields, to pick up stuff from the fields. I, think, I, don't think it's very, I don't think it's very ever very wise to get political from here. But I will mention this. This is God's welfare plan. This is the way God planned it. For people who had to be able to give to people who don't. But, the, but the, beyond that, the people who don't have it had to go get it. They had to go work for it. That's all I'm going to say. That's the perfect welfare plan. If you get it, you need to earn it. You need to work for it. Okay, I'll quit being political again. So there's one law. That's the gleaning of the fields. Another law is the death of a husband. Let's see. Do I have that mark? Probably not. But I can turn to it. Um, So we have Naomi, and she's got these two daughter-in-laws, and both of the daughter-in-laws lost a husband, and Naomi lost two sons. The law that God gave said that if, if, if a man dies without a son to carry on his name, then a brother is obliged to marry that widow. And Deuteronomy 25 we're going to, we may put up here in just a minute, but Deuteronomy 25, let me read, read this law. It's really, this is the stuff I like. This is the interesting stuff to me. It says this, starting in, in verse uh, 7. If, and if a man does not wish to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to perpetuate his brother's name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. And then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. And if he persists, saying, I do not wish to take her, then his brother's wife shall go up, now this is the widow, shall go up to him in the presence of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. That's God's law. 
he becomes humiliated is what it is. Why would God do that? Why, why would he give a law like that? Well, I'll tell you, he, God, these are God's chosen people, and he's doing everything he can to perpetuate, to perpetuate his, his, uh, his chosen people. I apologize. I did not. Anybody need a Bible? <laughs> If you do, look, I got them standing. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, they're gonna, these guys are going to walk down, and they're going to hand you a Bible if you need it. Josh, you should have waved at me or something. Yeah. Josh was kind enough this morning to pray for me. I needed it, and he was, he's a good brother. I appreciate that very much. If you need a Bible, get it. And if you don't have one at home, take it home. Uh, we're, we're glad for you to have it. Okay, so you've got the, the law about the gleaning fields. You've got the law of the death of the husband. <clears throat> now, think about this, too. Let's say you, you, you're a guy, and you've got a couple of brothers, and you start, this, this gal looks really attractive to you, and so you start getting around with her, and then finally you propose, right? And you come back to the family and say, okay, I, I, I'm engaged, guys. It's all good. If you're one of those brothers especially if you're the guy that's out in front at, in the army, you know, or if you're the guy that takes all the chances and you might just not live. If you're one of these brothers, you're kind of hoping he better pick the right person. Because not, you're obliged to marry this widow. So I got a feeling they were all in on this, uh, this, this uh, engagement kind of thing. So those are, the, those are two of the things. The third thing is, uh, that we're going to talk about today is, is what's called the, the, the redeemer, the kinsman redeemer. So if there's no brother, if we have a widow with no child, with no son, and there's no brother, then she, she needs to find a redeemer, and they need to be of kinship. <clears throat> it's her prerogative. Things are totally different in this, this culture. It's her prerogative. She has got to make the choice. It's not the man wooing the woman. It's the woman checking all the guys out that are kin and choosing herself which one would be her kinsman redeemer. And again, that's why I'm going over all this. You, this is a, a mindset we have to change the way that we do it now. Uh, so now that Ruth... Naomi told her way long time ago, right before they came, she said, look, I can't, you need to go back to Moab because I can't, I'm too old, I can't, I probably won't get married. If I got married and had a baby today, you'd be an old woman before that guy, that boy, and if it's a boy, you'd be an old woman before he got old enough to marry you. Go back. And Ruth said, no, your people are my people. Your God's my God. You think that was chance? You think that was luck? Do you think it was chance that Ruth chose to go with Naomi? Nope, going with you. And do you think it's chance, if you, know, if you, if you remember the story that Ruth sent, I mean, Naomi sent Ruth out to go glean in the field, right? Do you think it's chance that Ruth chose the field of Boaz? Or was there this big neon sign up here that says, Boaz, here I am, Boaz bushels, what, whatever you want to call it. You think it was chance of that? Or was it God's will, God's providence? Of course it was. Of course it was. There are times in my life that I can look back and think, there was just a subtle little thing that happened. I had a choice, and I had this or that, and I just, you know, I don't know, I'll go this way. And it worked. It was right. Do, was that chance? Or was that God taking care of his dumb little kid, pointing him the right direction? It's never luck. No such thing. So Ruth is right in the middle of all this God's providence. Ruth is right in the middle of, of, of uh, learning about God and that kind of thing. And she was going to 
to uh, glean in his field, and you know that Bo. And Scripture says she and Boaz had a had a relationship, if you will. He invited her to eat with them, and I'm sure over a period of time he got to know her. He had conversations with her, and he began to care for her, and he began to love her. He heard about what a wonderful daughter-in-law she was. And how she took care of Naomi and came, came back to Bethlehem with Naomi. So Boaz started really caring for Ruth and loving her. This is a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story. Okay, so that's the law. So you've got the gleaning of the field law. You've got the brother marrying the, the widow law. And you've got the kinsman now who the widow is going to go choose if she can find a kinsman to, to pay a price to redeem her. To, to give her back all her land, it's, and, to, and, and it's, uh, he would also be obliged to marry her. There's your laws. One other thing we need to understand is called the threshing floor. <clears throat> this is really, uh, I love this part. So the threshing floor was a very important part of the culture because it was when they started preparing, uh, getting their grain for the, for the winter. The threshing floor was always on the east side of a town, Usually it was on an elevated spot, and they would bring in clay, and they would pack that clay down as hard as they could. Of course, this is in the desert, so they'd wet it, pack it, and it would dry, and it'd be like brick, okay? And so they'd have this brick courtyard or brick patio, huge, if you will, and, and they would bring their grain, all the, the whole sheath, and they'd spread it out on the threshing floor, hook up an ox, hook up, hook up oxen to a sled of some sort, and, and that oxen would walk around, would go around on the threshing floor, and that sled would crush the, the grain, whether it's barley or wheat or whatever, it powder it, it turn it into pieces. And what they would do is take the seed out of the husk, okay? And so then the men would wait. That would be in the morning, and the men would wait till the wind started to blow. The reason it was on the east side is where, where does the prevailing wind usually come from? The west side. So it would blow west. The reason it was high is so it would get more wind. So what they would do is scoop up all that crushed stuff, throw it in the air. The wind would blow the chaff away. The seed would fall to the ground. And once the wind started, they would do it until the wind stopped. It might not start till noon, 1 o'clock, whatever. It may not start till 4 or 5 o'clock, but if it ended at midnight, then that's when they'd stop. They kept winnowing, throwing all day, and that chaff would blow away all day. And that's the threshing floor. And then at the, at the end of the day, they would have this celebration where uh, they would eat and drink and be merry, <laughs> And the men then at night would lay with their head toward in a, all around that big pile of grain, would lay around with their feet out and their head in, and they would guard their grain. Interestingly, uh, there's another mention of a threshing floor in the Bible. So the threshing floor typically was up on a hill, and then the wine press was down in the low spot. The reason is if you took a big cluster of grapes, you'd rather carry it down instead of up. So they would put the wine press down low. Interestingly enough, when Israel wasn't doing so well, there was this guy named Gideon. You've heard of Gideon if you've been in a motel. <laughs> and Gideon was hiding in the wine press, threshing grain down in the valley, not much wind, and he's hiding from the Midianites. And he, I can just, I don't know why, I've, my mind does these, but I can see him picking up a little, doing this and going, because <laughs> there's no wind down there, you know. And what's really interesting, if you read it, it's in Judges, if you read it, this angel shows up to Gideon and says, hail, mighty man of valor. And he's like, who, me? <laughs> he's hiding. Inter and, and what's double interesting is, this is how God uses people. He took 300 men and defeated the whole Midianite army. That's Gideon. So anyway, that's the threshing floor thing. So you know the threshing floor story. You know the wine press. You know the wind. The chap blows away. The celebration, how the men sleep. Now, here we go. I got to turn over to Ruth. Ruth chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, my daughter... Should I not, I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? 
Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. Don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say, I will do. Isn't that interesting? So there are several things here, but one, she's, the first thing she said, and remember who Ruth is. And that picture we're showing of Ruth, it's, it's good because more than likely, Ruth was a very pretty young lady. She was young and she was very attractive. People were attracted to her. Boaz certainly was. She was different than other people. Her, she was a different race. So she was probably more dark-skinned, but probably a very beautiful young lady. But she was in mourning clothes. She was not taking care of herself. She was, uh, she was a peasant and mourning peasant. And so that's, that was, and, and sometimes in that culture, both cultures, the Moabite culture and her culture and the Jewish culture, they would mourn for a year. So she's, she doesn't look, you know, she's doing that. You with me? She's innocent. She, doesn't, she had ignorance of the law, and she's mourning. So Naomi tells her, I'm gonna, you need rest. And what that means is it's time for you to get a husband, and it's time for you to have a baby. And that's, that's what uh, Naomi is teaching her. Remember, Naomi is sharing God's laws. She's saying, here's what you're going to be able to do, and she's going to tell her what to do. So she tells her, Wash yourself. It's time to come out of mourning. Get those clothes off. Put on new clothes. Clean up, and, and it's time to move on. We're going to find you a husband. God is, and, and God is, by chance, not by chance, of course, God is leading Naomi to lead Ruth to do these things properly. So wash yourself. Then the other thing, and this is the, the, the part that it's, uh, we won't get deep into, but there is nothing, everything about this story is quite innocent. Ruth is acting very appropriately, and Boaz is certainly acting very appropriately, and there's nothing that goes on here. This is a public place that, she's, that Naomi tells her to go to. They're out in the open. These men are laying Now, they're probably not side by side, but they're laying all around this pile of grain with their feet out. They're facing out. So when they sit up, they can look out to see if anybody's coming. So there's plenty of people around. And uh, just remember, this is a virtuous situation. And she goes to his feet and uncovers his feet. That's just a tradition. I don't know. I don't know what it's all about. I, I kind of what I've studied, but <clears throat> what it really is is this is her marriage proposal. So, guys, well, we don't have any teenagers in here. I was going to tell you always, uh, you know, you know, take her shoe. I don't know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> but that was the way that she's going to propose that he claim her or that she claim him. I'm claiming you. I'm, I'm uncovering your feet. Now, dude, he's been celebrating. A lot of, we got a good harvest. He's been celebrating. He's laying there. He's kind of knocked out, all right? Feet out, all warm and cozy. And then she sneaks up, and she just uncovers his feet. Look at verse 6. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. You'd be, we'd, I'd be startled, you know, if somebody, if Teresa came and uncovered my feet at night, I'd probably wake up because my feet would get cold. And you'd wonder, why are you at my feet? You know, so that's, that's what's happened. Uh, and again, that's just the tradition. She stayed right there quietly, right at his feet, and uncovered them. And it startled him, obviously. 
page 2. See, I told you, it's quick. And he said, this is uh, verse 9, I think. Yeah, that one. He said, who are you? And she answered, well, I'm, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant because you're a redeemer. And what she was telling him was, take your cloak and take a corner of it and cover me. She stayed at his feet, showing that she had dependence on him, and she did. She was dependent on him saying yes. If he said yes, she would turn from a peasant back to her, back to Elimelech, who is Naomi's husband, back to everything Elimelech owned, and a joint heir with what everything Boaz had. She would be his wife. She would turn from that to that. And she's waiting for an answer. The kinsman redeemer was not quite like the brother. He could turn her down. It would still be embarrassing. The, the community would know about it. But, but so he, he had to answer. She's made the marriage proposal. He had to answer. And again, verse 9, uh, she, she answered, I'm Ruth, spread your wings over your servant. You're, you are a redeemer. Verse 10, and he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. See, Boaz probably had some age on him. And she's out there gleaning with all these, these dudes, okay? And she, she could have her choice of them or maybe many, many others. But she chose him. And he was so grateful. Why? Because he loved her. He had been visiting with her. He had known her. He heard about what a wonderful person she was to her mother-in-law. Her character was great. This picture of Ruth we have is wonderful, and that's a pretty lady that they took a picture of here. But Ruth was beautiful on the inside, too. She had something in there that Boaz wanted, that he loved, that he cared for. And so he was willing and happy and joyful that she came to him and asked him to marry him, if you will. And so in verse 9, he said, yes. And how backwards is that, guys? So I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I would venture to say in this room there was some proposals that were women to men. Anyway. So there was one right there. So. <laughs> so, verse 11. I, I put little lines on here, and I marked through all my numbers. Not smart. Uh, so, the net, verse 11 says, And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you're a worthy woman. And he said, I am a redeemer, yet there's, there's more. But what he's saying is your reputation is of extreme importance to me. You stay at my feet. You stay there. I will take care of you tonight. We'll, we'll, we'll converse. And I'm sure they, they conversed maybe all night. Who knows? I think it's just a beautiful story here. But so the rest of the story, and then we're going to skip down to 16 in a minute. But the rest of the story is she stayed there at night. He said, right before it gets light, I want you to get up, and you're going to go home. <clears throat> and I'll take care of some things. I've got some things to take care of, and I'm going to make this happen. And that's, that's the Loxley version, not necessarily the Bible version, but it's pretty much true, true to course. So look at verse 16 now. So she goes home. Verse 16, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, the mother-in-law said, How'd you fare, my daughter? <laughs> Can you see that? No one was like, how'd it go? How'd it go? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. <laughs> Boaz, brilliant. 
listen, if you're young and married, there's the best advice, one of the better advices I can give you is get along with mother-in-law. Do the best you can to get along. Uh, back in the day when Teresa and I would go visit, or even to this day, if, if, if we have a disagreement, her mom takes my side because I learned how to schmooze her very well. <laughs> Just saying. So Boaz had given her all this grain to take back because he wanted to please the mother-in-law. I'm not so sure it's just not a reward. Good Naomi, bitter Naomi, she wanted to be called bitter, but she was spreading God's word. She was telling God's law. She was advising uh, Ruth properly. She was doing everything like, like, well, we're going to get to that. Verse 18, she replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but he'll settle this matter today. So, what can we take home from this? Well, we can take home several things. First, church, Christian, if you're a believer, what can you take home from this? I can tell you, be a Naomi. Not the bitter part. But be a Naomi. What do I mean? You know what I mean. Share God's word. Teach God's word. Be a Naomi. Naomi gave wonderful advice. She was not ashamed of her God. And she told her daughter-in-law the right things to do. Be a Naomi. Boaz, what, what else do we learn? Boaz, folks, from the book of Genesis to the book of the Revelation, Jesus is all the way through it. He's all the way through every bit of it. And Boaz is a picture of Jesus. He is a redeemer. And Jesus is our redeemer. And we'll get into that in just a very short moment. So be a Naomi. Now, Ruth. Ruth waited a while before she cleaned up, quit mourning, okay, mourning that life, that pitiful life she had, and turned around and claimed her redeemer. She took action. Ruth took action. So this is for all of us, but mainly for those of us who may not have trusted in Jesus I'm not telling you that you have to do something to trust Jesus. You have to do, be a good person or do good works, etc. I'm telling you, though, that you do have to take action. You know, Boaz obviously loved Ruth. He loved Ruth dearly. He loved Ruth greatly. But Boaz, just like God, just like Jesus didn't force himself, and we're going to get into that too. So Ruth literally took act, action. She was active. She had to go claim her Redeemer. Just because she had the right to claim the Redeemer, she still had to take the action to claim the Redeemer. I've, I've talked to people a lot. Oh, I know about Jesus. Well, that's a lot of people know about Jesus, The book of James says the demons know more, and they know more about him than we do, and they tremble, but they're not going to live eternity with him. Ruth took action, and she claimed Boaz as her redeemer. And that, friends, is what this book teaches us, and that's what this story today teaches us, that we can know all about Jesus. Oh, my family raised me in church. Good for you. Oh, uh, my granddaddy was a preacher. Mine, out, mine was. Good for me. That didn't give me redemption. I had to go to Jesus and claim him, not, not by my good works, but it was a decision that we all have to make. It's like if you, this lottery, you know there was a lottery drawing, I think, last night, 800 and something million dollars. 
And if you do, you have the ticket. If you've got the ticket, I, I'm your best friend. In fact, I need a kinsman redeemer. No, uh, if, if you've got a ticket, what are you going to do with it? Just let it sit on the counter, look at it. Oh, this is a great winning ticket. What do you got to do? You got to go redeem it. You got to go claim it. You got to take action to get it. The prize is there. You just have to go get it. So I guess my final question to the church, but mainly to the lost, would be, have you been to the threshing floor? Have you been to the threshing floor? Have you gone, picked up, got over your old self, known that the Redeemer's there, knew who he was, knows he loves you? Have you gone and claimed your Redeemer? Have you trusted not just known, but trusted that Jesus is the way to heaven. Nobody, you don't have to know everything about Jesus to trust him. It takes faith to do that. So my, my question again, one more time, is have you trusted him? Have you gone to the threshing floor? Have you claimed your redeemer? Jesus will go through heaven. He'll go through hell. He'll go through death on a cross. And he'll prove that he is who he is by raising from the dead. He'll do, he's powerful enough to create this earth to do all those things, but he will not force himself in your life. Revelation 3.20, I'll close with this, says this. Behold, he's saying this to the church, but he's saying it to us too. I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens that door, I'll come in. I'll come in and eat with them and eat with me. But you got to open the door. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you're so good and you teach us through this beautiful story about what a beautiful, wonderful Savior that you are. And I pray, God, that my meek effort to translate this word to your word, uh, that you filter it and that you use it for your glory. Uh, Thank you, God, for being our Redeemer, for purchasing uh, purchasing us, for buying us with a price. I pray, God, that we will live our lives that way. And, uh, And we just give you that glory. We pray everything in Jesus' name. Amen.